Okay, and we are live. Um, okay, we're all good on that. This is Illegitimate Scholar. I am Sam. If anybody could tell me, make sure the audio is working. I appreciate this. If uh, that, if you're on Twitter, I'm going to link below the Twitter thing. It only comes live once I do it. If you're listening to this not live, I'm going to be reacting to a number of different videos um, and some articles, some woke anthropology stuff. Maybe, you know, sometimes that's just kind of a, a key word rather than meaning all that much. But some of these people are definitely what I would describe as woke. So YouTube link is on the Twitter. And um, let me know if you're in the chat. People usually trickle in. So I wait a few minutes to start. If you're not listening live, uh, there'll be a timestamp below once I'm done with this. Um, if I can leave it up. Thank you, Winter. I appreciate that. And please uh, like the video. Yeah, so this... This here, just, just going to wait a few minutes while um, people trickle in. They usually do when it starts. I got to organize my shit. Oop, there go. Okay. Wrote in the Discord. Bring that full screen to monitor it. Live stream. Okay. And the article... This, this is the article. I wrote a Twitter thread on this, and it did pretty well, which was great and fun. And so I wanted to talk about it. I'll probably cut this down afterwards. Oh, that's what I had to do. I'm not starting for a couple minutes. Please just hang out, put it on the background, you know, whatever. Um, just wait for people to join. It usually takes a few minutes. Um, not that, like, you know, we're going to get 100 people in here, but it usually gets up to a five or six at the beginning. I just don't want people to miss it. Oh, I can throw on some music. Sick. Acoustic cinematic. That's nice. Okay. Banners. This is also great. Hello. Welcome. If you're joining, appreciate it. We're going to start in a couple minutes. Um, so just waiting I could probably start. I'll tell you about it at the beginning, but then I'm going to actually start. So this was weird. Actually, you know what? Before we do that, at the beginning, before I actually get into the article, while I'm waiting for a few people to join, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you guys these people's um, Twitter profiles. And I didn't link them below the... Um, I didn't link them below the other video because I didn't want people to harass them. And that was good because it got a lot. You know, I, I just don't want to be involved in something like that, which I would be. Um, and pe so, but then, I mean, this is her. I, I put the picture of her. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't want to comment on her appearance, but it's just, it matches like, like memes or, or whatever in a lot of ways. I'm not, I'm not saying there's, there's anything wrong with her. I'm just saying it's, you know, somewhat expected. Um, which is funny. Sexism in academia is bad for science and a waste of public funding. I mean, I, I often do this when with a journalist or a scientist or whatever. I look up their early life. I look where they're from. I look where they went to college. And and often they're, they're people that are staunchly in like the upper class. They're very, you know, nose up types of people. Um, and that's okay. I mean, you know, that's their upbringing. They believe the things they believe. I, I'm not, it's just my analysis of them. I'm not, you know, it's not a value judgment. It's just uh, it's a judgment. Woman the Hunter. So, yeah, she was giving a talk on it. Um, oh, and this is the other one. There's a, oh, yeah, Master Class in Troll Whispering. So they gave a talk on whispering to trolls, which I assume... Um, you know, I assume that... It's a little, like, you know, they would probably think that I'm a troll, even though that I I went into their, I just broke down their article, you know, and, and but they don't view people like me who don't do this through any particular type of institution as, as being worthy of, you know, having opinions on this essentially, or or on anything about this. They, you know, they're, they're very into the idea of the institution um, is where the authority on academic matters is derived from. And, and that's essentially where the name illegitimate scholar comes from. 
Oh, wow. I wasn't sharing the tab this entire time. Okay. That's dumb. Got to remember to do that. Nothing wrong with a good physiognomy early life check. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Certain cases, you got to check them out. But sexism in academia, this is what I was talking about. Um, Masterclass in troll whispering, which is weird. Um, I am not a troll. Yeah. Where was the other one? The link was right here. Oh, and this is the other one. This superwoman pose likes Michigan, I guess. I always like when they're from like a normal college because I'm like always expecting to see some Harvard BS. Um, and then when it's just like a normal college, I'm like, oh, okay. The, I think the other one went to UCLA, unfortunately. But yeah, these are the types of people. This is them. Okay. So I just get to the point. I'm sharing my stats. Contacts. Um. Okay, if you're just joining, please. Uh, I'm just going to start in a moment. I'm just waiting. I just always wait five to ten minutes. Okay. I think we're ready now. Okay. Yeah. Got it. All right. So this is the first one that I wanted to do. This is the... The theory that men evolved to hunt and women evolved to gather is wrong. The influential, I'm not going to read through this whole thing, and you've probably already seen that thread that I did, but the influential idea that in the past men were hunters and women were not isn't supported by the available evidence. And so, um, yeah, and then they, they support that claim in the rest of the article. And I think that it is not a good claim. How's the... Um, How's the resolution on that? Can you guys see that well? That's probably better, right? Um, okay. Even if you're not an anthropologist, one of this theories, one of this field's most in influential notions, man the hunter. So hunter, hunting is a major driver for human evolution. This is what I still believe. I don't, they didn't convince me. Um, that human ancestors had a division of labor rooted in biological differences between male and female. Please let me know if uh, there's any problems with audio or anything else. So, uh, Man the Hunter has dominated the study of human e evolution for nearly half a century and pervaded popular culture. Oh, I'm going to turn this music off, man. That's bothering me. I'm s how do I turn the music off? I don't even know how it got there. There we go. Okay. Okay. I don't know if anyone liked that. If you liked it, you can, you know, add your own music. Um, okay. So this is a theory, 1968. Um, okay, but here's the thing. Mounting evidence from exercise science indicates that women that women are physiologically better suited than men to endurance efforts such as running marathons. Okay. And this is, they don't, I don't even think necessarily support this, but let's, they support it down below. Um, this is them talking about the 1968 book. Okay. So <laughs> at the time, conventional wisdom was that women were incapable of completing such a physically demanding task. This is talking about the 60s when this woman went on this marathon. Um, but here, but social media trolls, and this is where I, I think that her troll whispering thing, I, I, I imagine that she has a lot of issues with trolls, probably because she says ridiculous things, but social media trolls have viciously critiqued and labeled these depictions as part of a politically correct feminist agenda, talking about 
um, movies and TV shows that have women hunting. They insist the creators of such works are trying to rewrite gender roles in evolutionary history in an attempt to co-op traditionally masculine social spheres. And like, look, these are, these are the types of people, and I don't necessarily think this way all the time, but from the logic of this being a, um, from the logic of like, if a space is traditionally for one gender or a specific group, if another group enters that, then that is not okay. Then it is like you're colonizing the space. Like they are kind of like taking away a space that was traditionally one thing. And I know that they they view that as an acceptable thing to do against men. And they really believe that probably, but you know, I don't think it's that okay. Um, and I, and I think the, when you just present them, present anybody who disagrees with you and feels like they that other people are co-opting traditionally masculine social spheres this is an idea that i personally do agree with that i believe in um like i'm not a troll because i i feel that way and i'm expressing that and it, it's a way for them to dismiss the argument of someone they don't want to talk to and i think the other side of that um and they don't want to legitimize the beliefs of i think that they would say that it's impossible for that to happen to men because you know men are the privileged majority or or whatever language they would use but you know it's the idea that this isn't our ancestry is an attack on certain people's perception of it and it's something that i think is true um you know maybe it's not i think the evidence supports that it is but it's not like it's obvious that this that like are they really that committed to their own theory being correct uh, especially when like you see the evidence that they have and it, it you know it's a little patronizing it feels like when you're being dismissed as a troll if you disagree and and that is that is what they wrote here i i'm showing exactly what they wrote so if i'm misrepresenting them then you know feel free to to you know let me know what you think credit where credit is due that's a decent steel man but then it raises the question of how exactly are they trolls yeah it's yeah um, our recent surveys of the physiological and archaeological evidence for hunting capability and sexual division in labor evolution answer this question. And this is like whether man the hunter, hunter style assumptions about the past um, or attempts to project sexism backwards in time. So their idea is that the sexist time of the 1950s produced in the 1960s produced this theory that took away from women the... Um, they took away from women uh, like their history of, of being hunters. So this is talking about estrogen. Estrogen is a hormone. You need it. Everyone needs it, some more than others. Um, so they talk about sex here. Sex is biological, uh, which can be defined by, okay, they say this, chromosomes, hormone levels, gonads, external genitalia, and secondary sex characteristics. The term female and male in biological sex. And then they talk about gender, woman, man, non-binary. I'm not going to go into this right now, but this, this is a thing in cultural anthropology. Gender and gender representations are different throughout time. There are third and fourth genders. They're not exactly like the Decepticons claim they are, but they do exist. Um, so much of the scientific literature confuses and conflates female, male, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So... Sex and gender both exist as a spectrum. That's the part I wanted to say. These people think sex is a spectrum, which there is some aspects of that because there are, you know, there there are people that are on a spectrum in between, um, but they're very rare cases. And for the majority of people, it is extraordinarily binary. Um, you know, yes, there are differences and bell curves within the populations of males and females, but at the same time, there is an extremely significant, statistically significant in any way you could look at it, um, non-arbitrary distinction uh, between someone with an XY chromosome and someone with an XX. And I, and I legitimately think that this is an attack on humanity at the point where you're saying that we're not sexually dimorphic, which is essentially what, what you're saying if you're claiming that... Uh, sex is a spectrum in, in any significant way there's elements of it but they're they're fluffing up those elements um and look we're we're mammals okay we are mammals i know some of my listeners don't believe in evolution i don't want to talk about that but um we're mammals and 
we have human needs. And I think that a lot of these people are anti-human and they reject our human ancestry. And I don't, I don't like that. I want to be human. I enjoy being human. Um, give the video a like, if you're enjoying what I'm saying, please honestly dislike it. If you don't like it, because I, you know, I've done certain things, they get dislikes. So I'm like, well, that wasn't a good idea. That wasn't a good video. I need to know. So like, or dislike, do whatever you want. Um, yeah. So, okay, here we go. E exercise, physiology, paleoanthropology, archeology, span and ethnography historically has been conducted by men and focused on males. This is true. Um, but Ella Smith, the Australian Catholic University and her colleagues found that in studies of nutrition and supplements, only 23% of participants were female. Yeah, but it, it, who cares if there's a lower percentage? It's still enough to get a statistically significant finding for, for males or females, right? So like, why are you even bringing up what percentage it is? It's, it's irrelevant. Um, well, okay, this one's not. Only 3% of publications had female-only participants. So, I mean, look, if there, if there is a lack of, of information on this, I don't know. Maybe that's true. Um, okay, I want to get down to the, the part over here. So they talk about the difference. And I mean, they do talk about difference in, in males and females with fast twitch muscles. Um, they talk about uh, the difference in how men and women metabolize. You know, women have a lot more fat. So the muscle fibers of, yeah, slow twitch right here estrogen receptors. Um, this arrangement makes these muscles more sensitive to estrogen, including to its protective effect after physical activity. So uh, the point is, this is, this is not biological anthropology podcast. This is cultural anthropology. So the point is that women do or can in extreme endurance have more endurance than men. This is the thing. Um, but look, this is what they start citing, which is crazy. <laughs> If you follow long distance races, you might be thinking, wait, males are outperforming females in endurance events, but this is only sometimes the case. So there were a few cases and I, I, I literally don't care, so I'm not going to look into it, but females are more regularly dominating ultra endurance events, such as the 260 mile. Okay. This is a 260 mile event. They're more regularly dominating it. They, they, that just means they win sometimes more regularly. It's just an increase. 21 mile swim across the English channel, which is insane. And a 4,300 mile cycling races. I mean, these are extreme, extreme, ridiculous endurance events. Every 90% of males and females could not do this. The rest would need to train excessively to do it. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. This is not related to going on a hunt. Yes. Human beings were endurance hunters, but they weren't running 260 miles. What are you like? Why? You, you're going to swim across the English channel to go hunt. There should be deer right there or you're going to die because hunter gatherers did not get that many excess calories. What are you talking about? You're going to swim 21 miles. What does that have to do with hunting? It doesn't, it has nothing to do with an endurance hunting. It's we're talking distances of 10 or 15 miles to run down an antelope. We're not talking about 260 miles. It's insane. I mean, even the, the cycling one, the, this is a multi-day event. Like, what? It, why do they think? I don't understand why they think that cycling 4,300 miles has any relevance to hunting. How, how, who told you that that was true? 4,300. Can you imagine someone just riding a bike across the continental United States? just running down a bear the whole time. The bear's like, what the fuck, man? I caught this guy in North Carolina. We're in Missouri. Geography. Okay. Am I, am I alone here? No one's saying shit. What's up? Who's here? Where's JC at? We got 13 people in the comments. No one's saying shit. That's fine. I appreciate you guys being here anyway, but um, yeah. Illegitimate scholar, anthropology content, cultural anthropology podcast. Okay. Um, let's see. Men are not, whatever. Is there, there was something else in here I wanted to show. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, this woman's a badass, right? This woman, like, she's on an ultra marathon event. She's breastfeeding. That's freaking cool. And they do admit, like, hey, this is um, modern. <laughs> oh, I remember. I, we're going to talk about Neanderthals a little bit. <laughs> Neanderthals, I think, is actually how it's pronounced. Um, But, yeah, she's breastfeeding her baby. Love it. You know, I love traditional women. I love strong women. I do. So I'm, I'm into that shit. 
here for like five minutes before I go to work. Well, what's up, T Rex? Thanks for dropping in just for a few minutes. Appreciate that, brother. Um, skeletal remains of ancient peoples. Um, low sexual dimorphism. Yes, that's true. We do have low sexual dimorphism compared to gorillas and uh, chimpanzees, and especially, or not especially. I think bonobos are more similar to us. Okay, so here's the thing. Anthropologists also look at damage to our ancestors' skeletons for clues to their behavior. And what anthropologists can tell from something like this is whether somebody died a natural death, whether they had a broken bone that healed over time, so it was an old wound, or whether they maybe had a, a broken bone that, um, that they died from because it never healed, and that would look different in the archaeological record. But dude, they start talking about Neanderthals and, and Neanderthals, they were humans in the sense that, th that they were like, they were similar enough to interbreed with us. So they're, so they're classified as humans, but they weren't homo sapiens. And they had very, very, I mean, the archaeological record supports that they had very, very different uh, social lives than us. They were much less um, social than homo sapiens. They were also shorter and stouter. They weren't necessarily dumber. They might have actually been a little smarter than us in certain ways. But they were, I mean, you know, they were real um, in Europe. But they were only in Europe. There's a little bit of weird um, alternative archaeology evidence that they might have existed in South America is somewhere and not in North America. I don't know. But there is some evidence of DNA of Neanderthals over there. But Definitely, they were in Europe and almost exclusively in Europe, we think. So, and they didn't have as much of a carrying capacity as Homo sapiens as well. So, that, so they were less dense. They were less communicative. For example, there, there is a place in the Alps in Europe where um, there's, a, there's a mountain range. And between that mountain range, there is evidence of the Neanderthals trading with each other on each side of the mountain range, but not between the mountain ranges. There were there was distinct um, and no evidence of there. There was no evidence of any sort of trade or movement of goods between the Neanderthals on each side of the mountain. But but once in a later time, Homo sapiens replaced that Neanderthal population. That being through either um, interbreeding or through warfare. We don't really know the prevalence. Both of them were likely used, but we don't really know. Um, there actually was homo sapiens back and forth because there was evidence in the archaeological record of there being interaction between the homo sapiens groups while there wasn't for the neanderthals there's more evidence of that that neanderthals were much different in their social lives than than homo sapiens so that being said these these anthropologists they try to cite information excuse me about neanderthals in order to support the idea that women were hunting, because it seems that female Neanderthals were hunting. And look, the evidence of that, like it, this is this this is pretty new idea, but there is evidence of that. And like what they're saying is evidence for Neanderthal females hunting a lot. And uh, look, that's great. That's very cool. But that doesn't tell us very much about Homo sapiens because Neanderthal DNA is only like two percent. And it and it's not even and, and that's only in Europeans, white Europeans, like me. Like I'm two percent Neanderthal or like 1.4. It's like 1.5 to like three percent normally. So that's a long way of saying that they try to cite this as relevance, relevant information, but they admit themselves that there's no information in the archaeological record about Homo sapiens having this. In fact, they cite the opposite, which is evidence against their theory. Um, and this is about the 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 patterns. It's not just wounds of of bones that they can see, but they can also see actions that would have taken place over a large large period of time because you would see damage and um to the bones from the muscles of certain repetitive actions that are associated with things like um th things like maybe mixing or throwing a spear or jabbing with a spear or pulling back a bow and arrow or an or an uh, um an axolotl, whatever those are called, an atolatl, um, which was very common, or a sling. They they all are associated with um, with different specific markers on the bone structure from where the uh, muscles were moved. And again, you know, this is uh, this is not well, you know, cultural anthropology, and we go into other things, but that is 
biological anthropology, which is what the woman who did this is. Okay, what's up, Craig? How you doing, brother? Um, and Neanderthals were well into Asia. I I I assume that that's true. Denisovan cave had them as well as Denisovans. I need to look into this more. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the Denisovans. Uh, they they didn't reach like past the Gobi Desert in Asia, did they? I, I mean, if you're talking about Central Central Asia, I'm aware of the the Central Asia, but I, I guess I, I'm thinking. Um, more into like like east asia like china korea um chinese heartland okay so <laughs> okay so this is the evidence males living in the upper paleolithic the cultural period between roughly 45,000 and 10,000 years ago when early modern humans entered europe they were placed in the neanderthals do show higher rates of a set of injuries to the right elbow region known as thrower's elbow, which could mean they were more likely than females to throw spears. So that's your evidence right there. I mean, they cite it. Males living in the Upper Paleolithic, this is that cultural period. This is the early Stone Age, the early, early Stone Age. Um, they, they entered Europe, and over this 35,000-year period, males to females, more injuries associated with throwing a spear. So that tells you that females were not hunting. At, they were not hunting by throwing spears at the very least. You know, I'm not going to make a big claim from that, but it does not mean women were not hunting. Because this is also when people invented the bow and arrow hunting nets and fishing hooks. Okay. Like I, I bet some women were hunting with like, and they were fishing. Okay. I bet that's true. Okay, and pet peeve of mine, they're talking about grave goods. Their bodies were interred with the same kinds of artifacts or grave goods, suggesting that groups they lived in did not have social hierarchies based on sex. This does not suggest that. We do not know why they put those grave goods in there. It doesn't mean that it's related. It doesn't mean that it follows the same sort of logic that we have today with grave goods, which we barely even use. So, like, no, it doesn't suggest that. It can be used to reinforce other sorts of evidence, but it, it's, it doesn't make any logical sense that you would assume why you would assume alone based on grave goods that grave goods are associated with um, like there's no hierarchies just because they're buried with the same thing. It could just be a funerary ritual. It doesn't have to mean that there's no hierarchies based on sex. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, it doesn't mean there necessarily is either. But and there's no other evidence. There's no written evidence from these people. I think we have a few cave paintings, but this is so early on. There's not many things that are that old. So there's no other evidence to support this. So they're they're making this is their one piece of evidence is grave goods from these people. They have no other contextual information. And yet they're trying to make this claim that they were associated with grave goods or, or that there's no hierarchies just because they have the same grave goods. We don't know why they did that. We don't. There's another thing where they found a few graves of women, of females, skeletons with weapons in um, Viking graves. And they, they found like five of them. And they're trying to make this claim now that they, these were definitely women warriors. And look, they might have been. I'm sure there are plenty of women warriors over time. Um, it, it's definitely at a lower rate than men. And that's extraordinarily clear. And a lot of times when the women are becoming warriors, your society is not doing very well, or it's very, very warlike. But of course, women have always helped out in wars. They have always served, whether as soldiers or as anything else. Like it doesn't take away from, from the contributions of great women of history. It just muddies the waters and judges women based on the standards of, that should be attributed mostly to men. And it's, it's just dumb. This is the same type of thing when they don't want to like say that there's gender differences in people and stuff. There are sexual differences. Patrilocality. Um, yeah, so so I mean, the reason that female Neanderthals, it makes sense that they would be hunting is because Neanderthals lived in smaller groups, which would mean that, and, and the females were much stronger than our females, and the males were much stronger than our males. They still had differences between them, but they were all strong as hell. So they were more suited for that. And also everybody kind of had to be able to do everything because they lived in smaller groups. So they couldn't rely on a division of labor as much. So it makes sense that they would, they would do that. Um, okay. Was there anything else? 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Next one. Next one. We're going to watch a video. It's a video on the same topic, but it's this guy, Hank Green or whatever. Um, he is a pet peeve of mine. Oh, I got to share it. No, I am sharing it. Okay. Fantastic. Let's go. Earlier this week, biotech company Pfizer announced that okay? the vaccine it's developing for COVID-19 is 90% effective. Oh, and that boy. is very exciting news. It also comes this with some old. pretty big caveats, including the fact that they haven't formally published peer-reviewed results yet. We're going to spend some time working on that story. We don't want to come to you with something This rushed. is just we the beginning of the video. Think it through, talk I don't, it through, I don't figure know it out, the all the little details oh, here and there. Please. So that's coming next week. Until that. then, enjoy this news from the world of oh. paleoanthropology. Why would, you, why would that be the intro of this? There's a persistent stereotype that our early human ancestors had clear gender roles. Men were hunters while women were gatherers and foragers. While that's obviously an overly simplistic picture of diverse and complex social structures, research published last week in Science Advances presented evidence that some of the earliest big game hunters were female. Back in 2013, a local indigenous man found a 9,000-year-old burial site oh God, about 4,000 meters high again. in the Andes Mountains in Peru. Then in 2018, a research group visited the site with permission from the local community where they found multiple sets of human remains, hunting tools, including projectile points, and other tools for hunting and processing animals. Since folks were often buried with their earthly possessions, it was fair to assume that one of the people no, in the graves was a hunter during their lifetime. Fair. Bone experts determined that, that the set of bones was probably that. female by the looks of their femur. And back in the lab, an analysis of proteins from the subject's teeth confirmed that it was a female skeleton. This analysis involved amylogenins. Okay. In, according to the researchers, and including the new skeleton, 27 individuals, 16 of them were Americas from around the same time. They narrowed burials, sick on deck to, help I don't want to, hear to about fall burials. into this gender any, phenomenon any called sexual evidence. dimorphism. That's because when yeah. previous research looked at fossilized much earlier. Before this study, we thought that males from the extinct human species Paranthropus robustus were much larger than females, a phenomenon called sexual dimorphism. That's because when previous research looked at fossilized Paranthropus remains found in South Africa, it seemed like the males were noticeably bigger than the females. These guys lived alongside our ancestors, members of the genus Homo, it's about big. 2 million years ago. This new research describes the Paranthropus specimen that's about 200,000 years older. But here's the thing. A newly found, nearly complete skull was identified as male and was much smaller than expected. That made the researchers think that the size difference Maybe wasn't sexual dimorphism, but just oh region got an adjustment or complete okay, picture of how on to the next one. I'm more disappointed. My expectations were nothing, and I'm still let down. All righty then. Okay, the NFL, you guys have probably seen this. This is just a quick, fun one, huh? Okay, the NFL needs to speak out against the Kansas City Chiefs fan in blackface. Native headdress. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, God. Wait a minute. This is... Okay, so this guy wrote this article a few days ago. Um, this is what they show, but I have this article, which then shows him like this. With the other half being red, they're just the team colors. Um, and also, this guy is a member of a local Native American tribe. This Native American tribe, so I wonder what happens. Um, Chumash Indians. Yeah, uh, that's the tribe that this kid's a part of, or at least his grandfather is, so he's Native. Um, and I look, we don't have to get into blood quantum. This is a conversation that Native Americans have, and that is for them to have, and None of my business because it's too goddamn personal. So I don't comment on it um, as I am not Native American. Um, and I do I do have some limits with the politically correct stuff. And that's one of them. Um, I wouldn't call it politically correct, though. I would just call it not being disrespectful um, in my own personal course, personal view. Uh, OK, so. Per front office sports, the Santa Ynez band of Chumash Indians, whom the fan and his family are affiliated with, have released a statement condemning the wearing of regalia as part of a costume. So this guy is doubling down. He's now, um, he's now saying that uh, he's like, okay, so I screwed up and I called this kid racist for doing blackface, even though it was black and red colors. And I was like, this little white racist. And then when they were like, hey, this kid's a Native American and it was black and red for the colors of the team. Now that that's happening, he's like, 
they can now he's saying that the tribe is condemning this kid for wearing this. And this is the often thing that happens. So cultural appropriation. The funny thing is that cultural appropriation is often used incorrectly. Uh, cultural appropriation is like it's when people will say it's for like, oh, you're wearing braids and you're a white guy. That's cultural appropriation. That's not cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, like we like culturally appropriated pizza, right? Like people, whenever there's cultural diffusion, when there, whenever there's exchange between different groups of people and there's archaeological evidence to support this throughout human history, there will be an element of exchange of cultural material. And then cultures will appropriate other, um, you know, other cultures ideas into their own in a way that fits in with their culture. For example, um, what's often talked about is African-American music uh, being appropriated by some white artists. But what's not really talked about is that that African-American music was written and performed on European instruments uh, using like bases of some European like musical structures. So African-Americans appropriated, and I'm saying African-Americans because it's an anthropological term um, that refers specifically to Freed American slaves, I, I say black people when I'm talking in colloquial speech, I'm not saying that as whatever, but when African Americans um, adopted these musical instruments and these styles from Europe, they added their own twist to it and they created new things. This is a good thing. This is, this is good. You appropriated something else. But the negative side of cultural appropriation, when it actually is negative, is a case like this where the kid is wearing a sacred headdress. And it's like the idea is that if there is and I'm not look, I'm not criticizing the kid at all. It's like this is like from this position. But the idea is that wearing the regalia is outside of its setting can cheapen and it can diminish like the meaning even for the people that have it when it's made into a mockery. And, uh, you know, I would say that you should consider if you don't think that maybe some of this is bad of another example of cultural appropriation that that I see. And that is, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but these nuns, uh, the the drag queen nuns, I this is cultural appropriation. They're called Sisters of per Perpetual Indulgence. I, I'm very offended by this, frankly. I And I'm not, you know, making that up. It's like they're making a mockery of a religious symbol that's very important to me. And I, I don't like that. And this is a bad example of cultural appropriation. Um, and, and this shouldn't be accepted. So, so look, so the, the other thing is that this is America and you get to wear what you want. So th th that's the thing. Um, I reject the idea before I even read the statement from the native American tribe that they get to have the final say on this, especially like, look, if it's a white guy, you're wearing a headdress. I don't think you should be wearing that. I'm not going to get upset with you about it. It's not my business, but I personally don't feel that that's an okay thing to do. I guess you know, someone could say that me wearing this Polynesian symbol is cultural appropriation. I mean, you could argue that, but it's, you know, I, I've never had anyone complain about it. Um, this is a little bit more serious for certain reasons. Um, but I don't even think this Native American tribe, well, let's look up where they're from. Um, okay, because Oklahoma has a lot of people that were moved from other places. So the Santa Ynez Band of Chumash. Um, oops. Santa Yanez. Santa? Oh, like Saint. I mean, were they even Plains Indians? Did they even have headdresses? If they don't, it's well, they probably did. If it especially if it was his families. Okay. Oh, I'm sharing the tab. So this is them. Um yeah, they probably did. Where's their yeah, so these types of headdresses. I mean, th this headdress here, the one that this kid has, is it's like a. It doesn't look real. It's like a. Um, I don't know. It, it it you know it's obviously made in that style, but it's like it's a. Maybe it's not though. Maybe it is a real one. I'm not familiar with all the styles. I shouldn't even be saying that. Um, we are aware that a young member of our community attended a Kansas City Chief game in a headdress and face paint in his way of supporting his favorite team. Please keep in mind that the decisions made by individuals or families in our community are their own and may not reflect the views as a federally recognized tribe. 
does not endorse wearing regalia as part of a costume or participating in any other type of culture. I mean, it's a pretty weak standard statement. Uh, they they kind of had to be like, yeah, whatever, you know, I guess. There's probably some people that are upset about it, but th this is not, there's probably debate in this community about it. You know, I don't know. It, it would be hard to tell. I'd have to start calling people. Maybe I will. But um, there's probably debate amongst the people. I know there is debate, debate amongst Native Americans with how they feel um about like you know the cleveland indians or whatever um okay it's just reading opinions go to this one but yeah i mean they're native american and the dead spin guy just decided to double down which i think is a really a, kind of a shitty shitty way to take it so we're gonna listen to olivia brown now talk about what who franz boaz is this guy is one of like the first big anthropologists um or father of American archaeology, I think he's considered. So you know, we're just gonna we're just gonna go with it, see what she says, and if I disagree with her takes, um, obviously, Franz Boaz has been a request for a long time now, and we're getting to it today. Really quickly, if you're new here, my name is Olivia, and I make videos about anthropology every single Monday. So uh, let's do it. So Franz Boas was born on July 9th, 1858 and passed Wait. away on December 22nd, 1942. Now Boas is from modern day Germany, but known for being an American anthropologist. Something that I didn't realize before researching for this video was that Boas actually spent a large chunk of his early life in Germany and didn't wind up living in America for many, many years. Now, as a young child, Boas was really, really interested in the natural world. He read a lot of books about these topics and it's kind of some foreshadowing for what he got into later being that he is uh, considered the father of American anthropology. Boaz went to school Thanks, in Germany and ultimately got a PhD in both okay, physics and- so this is a guy and... from, from the Prussian tradition, right? And he gets a degree in physics and what? Geography. Geography. Some people will argue that Boaz's doctrine. background in physics I mean, actually did plays it. a role in some of his theoretical anthropological frameworks, but others will completely disagree with you. So I would just say that it's a matter of opinion. But as not? Boaz got I, a little bit further I, I, in life, he really connected with the field of geography and ultimately did some geography research that led him to anthropology. So after going to school for physics and geography and spending a year in the military, Boaz ended up Who's going military? to Baffin Island in oh, Canada to do ours. some geographical research between the years 1883 and 1884. Now, while Boaz was on Baffin Island, he was doing research on the Inuit communities and how they were impacted by the local environment and geography. And not only that, but the how the Inuit people's that migration really cool. patterns were actually impacted by the geography. Now, I would argue, yeah. and I think a lot of other people would argue as well, that Boaz's time working with the Inuit people is when his love of humans and anthropology really began. Because remember, he was looking to understand not only the geography of this region, but also how the geography impacted the people who were living there. And I how might the not have anything to critique on this video. Migration patterns. And this is uh, just, yeah, this that is kind just of good anthropology. Up for the path that he was going to be on. For <laughs> she the might start calling him life. racist. During or something, this research no. on Baffin Island is also when some of Franz Boas's most famous ideas were born. One of the most notable ideas being that all cultures are created equal okay now right okay sweet perfect so this is what i talk about a lot some of you might have heard me talk about this on like the good old boys but i will defend up and down cultural relativity i just think it's applied wrong it's a perfect tool for ethnology which is the comparison of um i'm gonna make my face big for this one it's the it, ethnology which is a comparison of different cultures ethnology whereas ethnography is the study of a culture specifically so ethnology comparing different cultures if all cultures are the same in the sense that they all have socially constructed rules of right and wrong, that means you can just judge them very, you know, very, um, you know, across the board, more scientific. I, I always say that anthropology isn't really a science. It's more like a uh, humanities subject, but it does have elements of science. And you do want at certain times to put that 
to put that in there. Um, I thought I had a freaking book here. Uh, Clifford Geertz or whatever, but no. Yeah, sweet. So um, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Okay, let's go, Olivia. It may seem obvious now, but there was a time not too long ago where people did not believe. <laughs> My that bad, all winner. Yeah, she's a. Uh, she's other. a. They um, believed that one woman. culture was superior to another, whether that be because of the technology that they had, the resources they had available to them, where yeah. in the world. And this is they the kind of living, stuff that I love. How they looked, among many other variables. And while Boaz was spending this time with the Inuit people, he realized that that idea was a big load of crap. Through this research, he basically came to strongly, strongly oppose this idea. And this led to some of his famous frameworks and ideas that we're going to talk about in a little Wait, bit more what? depth here Hold in a up. second. So after his research, Boaz kind of bounced around for a little while, but he ultimately ended up in America in 1887. Base. And if I remember correctly, he was actually stopping in New York to then go somewhere else, but he ended up staying. Now in the US, Boaz began as a curator like video, at please. the American Museum of Natural it. History. And oh, not only was a he a huge impact be. on the field Love of anthropology, place. But he also had a huge impact on how museum curation was done. He suggested new ways in which curators should be presenting their artifacts, and now they're widely practiced. Some of these include displaying artifacts as they would have been used at the time, and oh, also straying away from this idea that we should be presenting artifacts in some kind of linear, progression, evolutionary order. Which kind of, well, again, gets at the idea the that no one culture is better than another. No one tool is more advanced and therefore superior than another. I think you get it. Advanced being does a not curator okay. at the American. So she Museum, said advanced does not equal better, but I would say that advanced doesn't necessarily even mean advanced advanced in anthropology has a different, like it's not really used in anthropology a lot because it implies one is better than the other. And when you're trying to do ethnology, when you're trying to compare different cultures, it doesn't make sense to privilege the standards of one over the other. Um, and look, I get it, guys. Right. Like the Aztecs sucked. They're doing human sacrifice. But that is a judgment from how I feel about it. The Aztecs, they felt pretty good about it. You know, they did for whatever reason. But uh, that's more interesting to me is why they felt good about it. What else about their society is going on that might explain why the hell they were cutting people's hearts out at the top of a freaking pyramid? That's crazy. Right. Like, I don't blame the conquistadors. But yeah. OK, bring Olivia back again. Museum of Natural History, he went on to become a professor of anthropology at Columbia University. Now, Boaz was not just some anthropology professor at Columbia University. He was the anthropology professor at Columbia University. Good for him. Not only was he a professor there, he started the entire anthropology program. And on top of that, his anthropology program at Columbia University was the first one in the United States. You're starting to see now why people call him the American father of anthropology. Wow. I'm enthralled. This is yeah, such he did that. Also, as a side yeah, note, he, did that. he okay. also was the guy who suggested that anthropology should be broken down into four fields. Yes. And if you don't know, Cultural, anthropology does have four subfields. Those subfields they don't do this in Europe, biology, though. culture, linguistics, and archaeology. And the reason we have this four field approach, it's because of Boaz. Really quickly, if you haven't liked and subscribed, definitely do that. Cause I make really? videos about is this idea that we shouldn't be evaluating cultures it's based the on the standards of another culture. Okay. We should be this evaluating cultures based on the standards of that culture. So this is cultural relativity. Evaluate them based on their own standards. And, um, and also like, this makes sense to me in the sense that it's like, yeah, you, you, you don't want to just judge. You want to understand. You, you want to try to, to get rid of it. Okay. I've had professors who would say with a straight face that bows are no better than firearms. That's in context of a military conquest, not advanced in the abstract sense. Yeah. Look, they'll say some wacky stuff. That's obviously like in, in the sense of like, like, for example, there are certain cases where bows are better than firearms, depending on the type of firearm. Like, you know, the the West wasn't won. The Comanche weren't defeated until they had repeating rifles in the mid 1800s. But like in general, we're talking an M16 versus a versus a bow and arrow. 
you know, I think something something wins. I mean, even if you go back to Rourke's drift and you go to the Zulu, like, look, I, the British are the ones that had it. OK. There's a clear difference there. Yeah. Sure. By examining cultures in a more contextualized way, you're taking away a lot of unnecessary judgment. Yeah. Um, because a lot of bad things and, and that's came why it's from good. the ways that people so were judging cultures her. during Boaz's time. She's really just informative, so, so I, there's not short, often cultural time when I strongly really disagree with her. Good thing, and it also exists in opposition to something called ethnocentrism, which I don't really have time to get into today. So once again, we're going to link a video. Dope. Not for academic watch, study, but just for, you, you know, being a person. The last or thing that Boaz believed ethno, and was a you know, big part of, You shouldn't of, have an anti-in-group bias, so whatever in-group that is. great, dare I say. You love yourself. Uh, is that he was really opposed Even if you're white. to scientific But racism. also the other races are cool, too. For many, many years, people believed, academics believed, that race was some yeah, racism. A little dive into it all. Okay. On to the next one. Nah. Dark side of YouTube, human evolution, and Robert Seffer. Um, this guy. The, the reason I want to watch it is because oh, I gotta share the tab. The reason I want to watch this one is because it's got so many negative reviews. Let me know if you want to see that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go to some of the shorter ones first. Okay, we're gonna go to this lady's one. Um, I feel you shouldn't judge people, Craig, uh, in the past by our current standards like slavery. Yeah, you know, slavery is a weird one because it like kind of was it was nearing like its end. Like it had been around for all of human history. People don't talk about the rest of it, but it's around all the time. It gets ended in a few localities throughout history, but it's around the whole time. And like at a certain point, it's meshing with modern technology and it makes it a really weird thing to do. Um, let's recall when the conquistadors ran across Mayan sacrifice, the Spanish Inquisition was also doing pretty crazy shit to people's bodies. Um, yeah, I mean, the stuff on the Spanish Inquisition has been really, really, uh, it's been played up quite a bit. There wasn't exactly as much torture. Um, and the deaths were a lot lower than people claim. Uh, I don't have time to do it. I, I might do that another day. That would probably be a good topic. But the Spanish Inquisition has been, it, it has a lot to do with uh, the United States being an Anglo country. So there is, there's a lot of inherent Catholic and Spanish bias in our, like, our history because we're an Anglo-derived country and their mortal enemy for the longest time was the Spanish. And people kind of forget about it because that's not true for the last like 150 years. But like Francis Drake, like all these famous early modern Brit Brits are fighting the Spanish. They're fighting papists, which is just a slur for Catholics. Um, so the Spanish Inquisition wasn't necessarily as bad as it's claimed to be. And there wasn't really a lot of torture involved. Uh, there was definitely some torture, but, you know. That is a good point, is that, yes, there was torture involved, even if it was less of a big thing than it's usually thought of. But another thing in general that is a little concerning in human history is that torture is pretty damn common. Um, a lot of a lot of cultures are torturing people, like pretty much all of them, including like the Romans and shit. I mean, they were you know, crucifying people. Um, even the civilized ones were were torturing. Everybody's torturing. It's gross. So. Let's hear it. To my channel. Today's topic is a serious we'll and sensitive one. Oh, and God. it's taken me a White little women. while. I, oh, it's still, it's still me. All right, guys. This white woman's about to explain to you um, about racism. And she's about to show you how uh, how great she is. So, so let's hear it, white lady. Tell us all about racism, Mrs. White Lady. Well, to get up online for you because I it's wanted to really take the time to make sure that I was gonna be happy with what was being said and that everything that I was talking about was correct and well-researched because I really wanted to make sure that I got this right. Today, we're going to be talking about racism in archeology. span Right uh, now, you if you for, haven't right? noticed, there is a global conversation going on about racism and white privilege <laughs> and the heritage sector is certainly not exempt 
from that conversation. Mm. Even though I'm not an expert in this topic and I clearly benefit from I white like privilege, I, I wanted clearly to speak about this from white because I clearly up. have a platform where I'm able to do so uh. and have my message reach across to quite a significant number of people. At the time that I'm posting this, I have around 2,500 subscribers and over 100,000 views on total over my entire spent channel. Like a minute and just I just talking about herself. really wasn't comfortable not posting about this topic and having people I just think that I it. either didn't have an opinion about it. I need everyone that to know my I'm not opinion was that talking about this or this topic doesn't really matter because it does matter. She I'm obviously literally just not said the only she needs, she needs, she, this was about not her. Listen. Posting about this topic. And I just really wasn't comfortable not posting about this topic and having people think Why? that I either didn't having have an people opinion think about that it I didn't have or an that about my it, opinion was that, that talking about this or opinion. this topic doesn't really matter because it does matter. I'm obviously not the only person and not the only archaeologist speaking on this cares. topic. There have been a lot of conversations going on right now about oh, this in the oh, heritage sector the and the Amendment. heritage world. And I'm going to link a bunch of them below for you. Yeah, no, so like that I probably you like this woman. To educate yourself more this. than just listening to me. Oh my God. Now, for educate those of you yourself who aware, more. No, I probably wouldn't. Like archaeology does have a history of racism, and it currently does yes. have a racism problem. I'm yes. not saying that you know all archaeologists in current day are racist or that all archaeology that's ever been done but has been racist, but you racist. can't ignore the uh, strong undertone of racism and white no, privilege that runs through archaeological practice. This has its roots. Wait, no, I wonder what she thinks of Kathleen Kennedy. She probably thinks that criticizing Kathleen Kennedy is sexist. Um, yeah, they don't. Guys in Star Wars, they're not ready for a strong female character. What about Ahsoka? What about the 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 bounty hunter chick whose name I forgot? She's badass too. Come on, man, it's a BS. In the fact that archaeology is a discipline that has its beginnings as a hobby Star of Wars rich Wars white people stuff. who oh, would yeah, go into people. other oh, countries right. and saw no impediment or reason why they shouldn't be studying. Are you Chinese or Japanese? Interpreting it themselves instead of oh, having yeah. the people of whose history it was interpreting it, and then. In yeah, let's everybody just interpret our own culture. That, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's let's just let's just get the opinion of like the Irish Catholics about the troubles. Let's not let's not talk to the Protestants. Now let's just talk to the Catholics. That's a good idea. In some cases taking that heritage back to be displayed in a museum. Yes. Early archaeological practice exploited local oh, populations the and then turned around and dehumanized them and discriminated against them and using these the people's heritage yeah. as justification for why they were lesser than white Western. Civil well, yeah. Okay. So she is describing a real thing in that like anthropologists in like the 19th centuries, they, before cultural relativity came about, there was like a sweet spot, right? Like, cause there was, they, they did some good research in the, in the 1800s, but it was also tied in heavily with a lot of colonialism. And look, I, I know people have mixed feelings about colonialism. I do as well but I don't have mixed feelings about Leopold's colony in the Congo, right? Like that's not like, that's not colonialism as a whole. Like there's a lot of cases of it specifically that are really screwed up. Um, and, and, you know, these anthropologists are going out with military expeditions and stuff and they are making value judgments, you know, that that's what they did at the time. And we can study their stuff at the time and understand it wasn't the best, which is kind of what she's saying, but I, I wouldn't condemn it to the level that she is, I guess, or or say that just because they were racist or they had racist ideas that their work is entirely like not worth anything. But the this sweet spot in anthropology in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, when you have cultural relativity, but you don't have woke cultural relativity that just like hates white people, basically. I mean, that's really how it kind of seems. Um, when you actually apply cultural relativity across the board, including to your own culture without this in-group bias that is inherent in liberal whites, that's in Gallup. That's a freaking thing. OK, don't get mad at me if that's the case, but th that's the case. So um, that's a thing. And uh, we got to reckon with that. But yeah, let's let's hear more about this lady. Civilizations, a.k.a. colonialism, you know, archaeology and heritage have repeatedly 
been used throughout history to I think promote isn't, racist isn't propaganda and agendas, and they have been an like, active this is part of promoting this idea world, right? that to be white and to some extent to be Western is the pinnacle of civilization, what everyone should aspire to, and anything that doesn't fit that is all. Okay, so look, I don't necessarily think that the West is the best. Um, <laughs> that was the slogan of those guys. But like, look, for me, I like Western values. I do. And I should be allowed to have that. So what I what I don't like is that she's saying like, oh, like Western values are not necessarily the best. I'm like, OK, Western values aren't the best. But you then can't import people from across the world and make them immigrants. Like I'm not necessarily anti-immigration. But if you're going to have immigration, you also have to have assimilation. So I, I, I think it's fine if this type of idea is applied to like the international world. But we shouldn't apply this idea of like oh no it's totally okay you can have whatever culture you want to people um from completely other countries and completely other cultures and bringing them i mean it's not the way that you make a stable country i'm just being realistic here i know that that sounds like you guys don't care because you're conservative mostly but um you know not that you wouldn't be welcome here if you're not i'm happy to have everybody i'm i'm pretty apolitical but socially conservative so but it's it's not a i don't really view that as a conservative idea uh, personally, I, I get why people do, but it's just, I feel like it's just being realistic. Obviously not as important, not as significant, uh, which isn't true. While people have been working to dismantle these practices and racism within archaeology, they still permeate throughout the discipline. For example, you may have heard of ASOR, which is an international just, organization they have fights with each whose other mission and is each other to by initiate, encourage, and support research into and public understanding of the history and cultures of the Near East and Mediterranean. But their name is actually the American Schools of Oriental Research. Oriental. Really. Like in this day and age, there's... He probably doesn't even know what Oriental means. It means East. That's all it means. She's, oh my God, look at her face. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I was just playing it. I wasn't, there we go. Look at her face. Oriental. Oh no. Who cares, dude? You just, they just hear that the word's offensive and then they commit to it. Still using that word, even though we all know all the connotations associated with it. ASOR is not alone in its use of an outdated and racist term. Or oh the my God. This is what she's taught. Look, there is some like, Look, <laughs> this is not important. They put people in human zoos in the early 1900s. It's disgusting. They did that, okay? I don't care about the word oriental. There's so much worse stuff. What happened to Dan? What, what do you mean what happened to Dan? Oh, if you're asking why he's not on the stream, he's in Indiana right now. He's, he's with his family. Um, He'll be back on the streams in a few days. And I, I'll be at his place for like 10 days at the end of December into New Year's Eve. Communities within the Near Eastern and Mediterranean region, as you just have to look at places like the, like video, the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago who, and the University cares? of College London School of Oriental and African Studies. <laughs> as I said before, archaeology began as a rich white people hobby. And to this day, oh, yeah, in a lot of ways, it largely remains that way. By and large, no archaeologists doesn't. are white, middle, and upper class people. people. In addition to people. being one of those people. I okay, have holy crap, dude. Oh my God, these people, bro. I They're women. They're mostly women. And most college professors are upper middle class people. Okay, this is ridiculous. Northwest Indiana. Were you, JC? That's interesting. Um, you should. Oh, did did you ever ask Dan where he was from? You, if you would mention that, he would have. Oh, does it not just mean east? Oh, okay. So yeah. So sear, spiced olive oil. Yeah, so, what I'm saying is, I think the original meaning of the word was east, but I think it became to mean that over time. I'm not sure about that though. So like, uh, I, I I guess I would just want to know what the root of the word is. I'm big into um, etymology, I think it's called, with how words change. It's very important to look at how words change because, you know, something like the Second Amendment has the word uh, well-regulated militia in it, which meant something completely different back then. But people will take the, the definition of regulated today 
to mean that it means something else. I've seen this reflected throughout my entire studies and career. My undergraduate course was almost entirely white. To my recollection, there was only maybe one other person that studied in my class, in my graduating class that identified as a person of color. During field school, this obviously didn't change. There was another dig that ran in the same school, town right. as us that had more common diversity, but it was still in very, very low numbers. My master's course was entirely made of white students. The entire time that I've worked in the UK as a field. Okay, I'm just gonna, you know, <laughs> just for a moment, we're gonna move over here. So Oriental is, um, come. It, it comes from the freaking of the Orients from the East, from Old French Oriental, Eastern from the East. So it, it does come from Old French like that. that. That's at least what this website says. Sorry, <laughs> take this side note of etymology. For archaeologist, a I've never personally met an archaeologist of color working on any of the era, sites that I've been on. This doesn't mean that archaeologists of color don't exist in the UK. There's over 6,000 archaeologists working color. in the UK. I haven't met all of them. But I think that the fact that I haven't met one says a lot because I've worked extensively throughout Scotland and England on multiple sites for multiple companies on some of the biggest <laughs> it's about her projects in the country. It's about her personal experience once again. According to a document called Profiling the Profession, which was published by a company called Landrub Research in 2012 slash 13, don't, don't make harass or anything, please. I don't, I don't want to be involved in that type of shit, but... And this is unchanged. What? 99% of a company called Landrub Research in 2012 slash 13. 99% of archaeologists working yeah. in the UK well, identify as white, as white and country. this well, is unchanged was, from the same report from okay. a decade earlier. Who cares? I don't, I don't care. That is a high percentage. Of the UK SG to be PhD in subjective Look, interpretation. Here's another thing. It's a very classist country, and I'm sure she doesn't want to talk about that, but like this is very common for rich white people or upper middle class white people to do. They really concentrate on like, oh, they'll concentrate on the race because if they're just as privileged as any other white person, then it means that they get to look down on and judge other white people who grew up way less privileged than they were in poor because they just ignore those factors. I don't have a lot of patience for it. Don't like it. We'll see if I still want to listen to this. Oh, look at that. Nice stills. Therefore, the more viewpoints that you consider or have, the less bias you're going to have and the closer you are less going to bias? be to actually knowing the truth of what you're looking at. Oh. Not having diverse range of perspectives, some of the okay. First Nations see, in Canada. I... <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just listen to I, it. Therefore, the more viewpoints that you consider... Okay, so yes, you should have more diverse viewpoints, but she doesn't, she would never consider the fact that probably 99% of anthropologists in the UK are also liberal. They're not conservative. So you want diversity of race. So you get to decide what the diversity that you want is. You, I hope, is she going to talk about class at all? She's talking about the UK, which is a very class based culture. It's very hard to argue it isn't. I think the US is as well, and there's a lot of evidence for that. But it's widely accepted that that England is or have the UK. less quiet you're going to have. And the closer you are going to be to actually knowing the truth of the what truth you're in this sense, at. not having diverse okay. range of she's saying the truth of what you're looking at. This is a religiously devoted person to this idea. Truth does not it's to when it comes to data limits what we can get out of it. Really great example of this is some of the work that's being done in North America. If you are investigating the heritage of First Nations in Canada, it really doesn't make sense when you're doing interpretations of those investigations not to invite the perspectives of the descendants of those people uh, that you I mean, are studying. You should probably they get have their a connection and a knowledge of that past that no archaeologist could ever access themselves. Maybe it means they're more so emotionally how close to it. Maybe they should we try to know. move forward yeah, and I mean, fix this problem listen. and make archaeology a more diverse discipline. Well, the biggest thing is that we have to encourage people to become a part of the discipline. And clearly, that's somewhere where we have been failing. We have been failing. It's me again. My personal actions are part of this. But why? Ugh. That's a complicated answer. That's not going to have just like one fix all solution. There are a lot of factors that can contribute to why a person of color may feel discouraged from <sighs> pursuing a career in archaeology and heritage. But when I was kind of looking online and reading articles, yeah, about she is this, making some fair. There point. are a few no, kind there, of like there are things, things that here I think that, that need I agree to be with. addressed. One is the perception that archaeology is not an economically viable job, or the fact that it's not even 
a job, you know, people thinking when they're young, oh, I want to be an archaeologist, but not actually thinking that's a viable career that they can follow. The fact that it doesn't pay well, it doesn't give anything back to the communal good. That's not true. Certainly when regards well, to pay, you know, I make more than enough money to pay my it's rent and my bills, have some be left over claim, and gotta, live a good a life. I know archaeologists who own houses. I know some archaeologists. Wait, that's her. <laughs> I know archaeologists that own houses. That That's her thing this is where we've fallen as a people to the point where owning a house is like oh look like be an archaeologist you might be able to own a house i know some who make very good money as the leaders of businesses in terms of communal good okay so they make money as not not anthropology they had to do business instead i mean i guess you can include anthropology i guess i run an anthropology business but i don't make a lot of money off this. This is complete passion. Good. Here in the UK, community archaeology is a whole subset of the discipline that is entirely dedicated to involving local populations with their own heritage as well. Another discouragement might be the fact that there is a bad history between archaeologists and people of color that's created mistrust between us. And I that's something that... We like, the only reason they know about all this stuff is how much these archaeologists talk about it. Why would a Black person living in the United States, if they're not made aware of it and told how racist anthropology is, which these people talk about how racist it is all the time. I know because I, I have the degree in anthropology. Um, they, they just, they're obsessed with it. It's like... So they, I think that they convinced everyone around them that they're the most racist field and everything, even though they're the least racist field. We as archaeologists have a little to bit more racist. work oh, at she overcoming. Needs we shouldn't just have this expectation of, oh, well, it's, it's different now and people should know that. And we have to work at creating that trust. I, I think one of the biggest reasons why people don't pursue this is because history. When you Okay. Like she's talking about the reasons why people don't pursue this, but like, she didn't ask any of the people. She didn't ask anybody. She didn't ask maybe a black person who had considered going into anthropology. She said there were 600 people working in the UK who were anthropologists that were people of color. So like, you can't send an email. You work in the same field. I don't understand that. You're taught it in schools is not diverse at all, especially in the West. You learn about Western history, Europe, Britain, North America, it's biased et cetera, in other ways, and that's you know? it. As a result, kids... Wait, let's, let me hear that again. ...diverse at all, especially in the West. You learn about Western history, Europe, Britain, Britain, Britain North America. North America. Yeah, you don't really learn about Europe. You learn about like five countries in Europe, and she doesn't care that we don't learn at all about Eastern Europe. Learn a little bit about Russia and serfdom and the Soviet Union, but that's that's it. You don't learn about Hungary. You don't learn about like, um, you, you don't learn about the Balkans. You don't learn about uh, Greece besides ancient Greece. But she doesn't even consider that that's a different type of diversity that you should consider. She just considers this one, which, you know what? Yeah, you should have a little racial diversity, I guess. But, you know, it, it's the only thing. It, it's, it shouldn't be the end all be all. And she, as a rich white person by her own admittance, is saying how like, there needs to be racial diversity, but she doesn't give a shit about poor whites at all. They never do. Not never, but often they don't. Et cetera. And that's it. As a result, kids from more diverse backgrounds probably don't identify with that. So they don't pursue it because they're not interested. Yeah. You know, like in my experience, I have, I talk to a lot of people of other races and lots of people across like the US. I travel all the time and I have like these types of people, like she literally says she doesn't know she doesn't work with anybody because she works in anthropology. So she doesn't work with anybody that's um, that's not white. Is that what she said? Because like, you know, this person would call me a racist, but I have I work with a bunch of non white people. And like most of the people that I talk to, maybe it's a selected few. Maybe it's like selected the ones that are my friends, but like they don't like liberal white people. We make fun of them together. It's funny. Um, we make fun of people like this. They're out of touch. They don't get it. And she, by her own admission, she doesn't talk. I mean, maybe she has some friends outside of work, but I, I doubt it. I would be really interested to see what happens if we taught the history of Africa, yeah, it, it is, Asian, in, in pre-colonial Americas is. in schools with the same 
emphasis and depth that we do Europe and colonial North America. The last point is that there is a real lack of diverse pop cultural representations of archaeologists for people to look up to. When I was growing up, what? you know, I have Indiana Jones, Lara Croft. Say what you will about whether or not they are archaeologists, but they are the ways that those seeds get planted. So we need these kind of like role model inspirations to be a lot more diverse. For example, Dr. Smolder Bravestone from the new Jumanji movies played by Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, is a really great example of a more diverse cultural representation of an archaeologist because he is an archaeologist in that movie. So I would well, really love to see... Dwayne The Rock Johnson is a white guy. Wait, is he Polynesian or something? But like, okay, he's a white guy. He's pretty white. He He's... Laura Croft wasn't on my bingo card. Yeah, I was kind of surprised when she said that. I didn't mention it. I'm sorry. I, I freaking, she is not a bad looking. I, I'm freezing it at bad times that. for her. <laughs> I'm also really interested to see how the next Indiana Jones movie that's planned is going to address this issue. Yeah, so that came out first. I'm I liked really it. I hoping that they do. There was it's a, a really great one. opportunity it for them me. to contribute to this more diverse so, representation yeah, wants, all of these things email, i just talked about are going to take more than me posting a post. video on youtube that about them to fix guess. but i wanted to make my contribution today to raise awareness <laughs> and to help contribute i wanted to make my my i'm sorry okay i she's it's just it's all about her why does it have to be about her she didn't have to do this she specifically said and i don't think she meant to but she specifically said she wanted people she said my or i three times in that intro contribute uh. to continuing this discussion that's going around this and driving forward positive change. I wanted to end by giving you some resources so that you guys can go out and begin to educate yourselves educate on this topic or become inspired to learn more and pursue uh, your interest in archaeology and turn it into a career, resources. a degree, whatever you want. So if you are uh, looking to learn more about some amazing examples of archaeologists of color, you should uh, look up John Wesley Gilbert, who's the first oh African-American archaeologist in the U.S. Teresa A. Singleton, <laughs> who's the first African-American woman to receive a Ph.D. in archaeology. Especially if you are in America, you should really look up the Society for Black Archaeologists. They did a really excellent panel. OK, OK, I'm done listening to this lady talk. We're going to go to the we're going to go to the places that she wants to talk about. And you know what? Maybe we'll watch this video. Let's see. Um, okay, Mansa Musa. Let's start with him. You guys have probably heard of him. So his wealth and generosity. Okay, this is a favorite of people. Let's just control F slaves. Um, yep, okay. Including departed Molly for the Harsh with 12,000 slaves. That's a lot of slaves, bro. That's a lot of slaves. This is your this is this is the guy you guys like. 12,000 slaves. All right. That's up to you, brothers. That's not me. That's between you and God. I got nothing to do with that. Um, okay. Now let's see. Okay. And Zynga. Oh, and I should say that, yeah, I, I do think that African, like I study a little bit of African history. It doesn't get talked about as much. But, and look, I, I don't know what she said because we cut it off. I, I can't listen to that anymore. But like, you know, you should learn about like it's fun to learn. I I like history, so I'll I'll learn about African history. I have I watched like um, hours long YouTube videos on it and stuff. There's not as much about it, but like I I look at it. But you got to be honest about it. They, they they always look at people like Mansa Musa with rose colored glasses. Like it doesn't matter that he was a slaveholder. No, it matters. Um, God. Okay. So Enzinga Ana de Souza Mbande. That is that Portuguese was a Southwest African ruler who ruled as queen, queen of Ambundu Kingdom and Ndongo and, and Matamba, located at present-day present northern Angola. That place is not going well right now. Oh, that's that's quite a bit in there. That's like, that's like the lower Southwest Africa. I thought Southwest was like, like the Gold Coast area, uh, like Ghana. Military and political training... Demonstrate an aptitude. I mean, she's a queen. She ruled during a period of math, ma rapid growth of the African slave trade and encroachment by the Portuguese Empire in Southwest Africa. Declared war on her. Um, okay, so th this is an African queen. Early, early time. I mean, 17th century. Or, I mean, she was born. Okay, so let's let's see. 
let's see what this oh god the rise to power seven-year-old ne nephew under the guardianship oh my god she got married to her nephew and then had him killed which she viewed as retribution for her son's murder. Yeah, you know, court intrigue at this time was really, really bad. Um, okay, but let's let's look up. What I really want to know is whether this was a slave kingdom, and I and I believe it is. Uh, Matamba, and she must have won by conquest. But Matamba, African state. So the first docu documentary mention of the kingdom of Matamba is a reference to it giving tribute to the king of Congo, then Alfonso I of Congo, ruler of the Congo. Okay, we're learning African history just like she wanted. We actually are doing what she wanted. Um, okay, missionaries from Congo, then a Christian kingdom. Okay, let's see about slaves. Okay, oh. Portuguese governor launched a large-scale attack on Ngongo. I, I want to know if they had slaves. Is during this period, for example, slave inventories? Oh, so that, no. Thousands of the Matamba subjects were killed and thousands more taken to America as slaves. Oh, well, okay, there's probably more There's probably more here, but, you know, maybe this kingdom was not a slave kingdom. A lot of them were. It was a common practice that existed prior to the Europeans coming in, specifically the Portuguese um, at the time in the, in the 1500s, 1600s, but not exactly in the same way. And it's, it's possible, especially in specific areas, that it wasn't as common before um, the Portuguese came in. The Arab slave trade was very common and was larger. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. The kingdom of Ndongo. This was one of the things that she was a part of, right? I mean, let me back up. Yeah. So, okay. So she was a queen ruled as queen of the Ndongo. So, so this one. And let's see the political structure so this is interesting this is some good social anthropology stuff or social cultural very similar um socio-cultural the kingdom of ndongo was composed mostly of free commoners who were called ana marinda or children of the marinda in addition to the commoners there were two servile groups the ijiko or kijikos were enslaved commoners who were who were originally captured during war permanently attached to specific territories as serfs and could not be sold. Okay, so they're they're serfs. Um some people don't agree but I generally view serfs as a type of slavery rather than um rather than like separate from slavery. I mean it's a type of enslavement essentially. You're just owned by the land instead of owned by any specific um like a specific individual. Which is just extra steps to get to slavery, but it's still slavery. You're just yeah. The Abika or Mubikas were war captives who were judicially enslaved and could be bought, sold, or inherited. Okay, so they had both. They had both. They had two types of slaves. That's uh um it, <laughs> it's it's something. It's something. I don't know what it is. Yeah, so I mean this is the type of stuff like slavery is going on here, right? Um now, do we even want to watch this? Probably not. She also shared Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is someone who should be talked about. He did a lot of cool stuff, man. I mean, I I should say he did a lot of cool stuff. He did a lot of terrible things. He did a lot of terrible, terrible things. But, but, you know, he he had a great effect on history. I mean, he had a. It's very interesting the effect on history that 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 he had because he came. He basically came through when he was like a cleansing. God, talking. Okay, Temujin is real original name of that dude. Oops, I screwed up. Okay, let's come back. We're gonna come back to present share screen. Don't 
dark side. Where is it? There it is. Okay, let's this has <laughs> this video has such like so many thumbs down that I just have to I just have to watch it. Um, let me know if you guys can hear that. Maybe let me make sure. Robert Seffer calls himself the most dangerous anthropologist. But what makes him, in my opinion, one of YouTube's most dangerous pseudoscientists? An individual with a rabid following that will no doubt make themselves known in the comment section. His content is just interesting enough to capture an audience, and his ability to mix truths with half-truths and outright lies is impeccable, allowing him to slowly indoctrinate his listeners. Talking about Robert He's gained a following of over half his a million. Many of them are great people, and I hope they give this video a listen. They probably don't even realize that he published a book called 1666, Redemption Through Sin. That book highlights an anti-Semitic conspiracy in which he believes... You can't just call a theory anti-Semitic. Just evaluate the evidence. It's a waste of time. I don't, I don't even care what the evidence is, but just, just, don't, just don't do that. Just don't come out and be like, oh, it's anti-Semitic. Like, no, tell me why. Tell me what the standard for anti-Semitism is. Let's have a long-form conversation about this rather than just assuming nonsense. These Jewish people have hidden the truth about Hitler. They didn't... F Wait, this says the Californian has also written... Okay. In which he says the Rothschilds control, controlled mainstream media. I mean, is that true? I don't know. And distorted the truth about Adolf Hitler. How? Hitler has been made out to be the most evil person to have ever lived by starting needless wars and slaughtering millions of people. What if it isn't entirely accurate? I mean, I don't know. It's the world's major corporations, mainstream, whatever. Follow his Twitter account prior we're not to doing his this. So they I didn't can't. see when we're he tweeted YouTube. that Jews were trying to subjugate Europe. Jews are white. You not liking them does not change. What the hell? Okay. I, I haven't heard of this guy. By flooding it with Africans. They don't even realize what they are watching is dangerous. This video is going to be a complete. I, I don't like when people try to decide what is dangerous for other people. It's this nanny state BS. This guy thinks he's better than you and he's talking down to you. You, you, it is on you to convince somebody that what they're watching is dangerous. You can't just sit here and be like, it's racist. It's not cool. You don't get to do that. Dismantling of Robert. Or my do. goal is Whatever. for everyone to finish this video with a better understanding of how these people can manipulate others so effectively. Dude, and part of that on. is because it requires a documentary style video to debunk. But we're taking that on, and I'm going to dissect one of his recent videos called Debunking Out of Africa. Now, Robert does have a habit of using copyright claims to censor people. So you'll notice I have his voice sped up and some other small alterations in this video. Wait, I'm sorry. What, what'd you say? Out of Africa. Now, Robert does have a habit of using copyright claims to censor people. So, you Dude. Copyright claims to censor people. He has a right to copyright his content. Do you not believe in copyright laws? What are you talking about? That's not censoring you. That's just, he, he doesn't want to share his information with you. He doesn't have to. But you'll notice I have his voice sped up and some other small alterations. Oh, so he made alterations in order to get around it? And that's okay? Alterations in this video. The term Gishgallop was first used in 1994 when anthropologist Eugenie Scott grew frustrated with an American young Earth creationist named Dwayne Gish. And Wait, let's let's find out what her deal is. The term Gishgallop was Gish first Gallop. used in 1994 when anthropologist Eugenie Scott grew frustrated with an American young Earth creationist named Dwayne Gish. And now with his initial statement from the Institute of Creation Research, Dr. Dwayne Gish. At its core, Gish Galloping is using quantity over quality to support your argument. Instead of laying out a clear argument back. This, guys, this happened the other day with an Olivia Brown video, and it happened with another, it happened with the Michael Shermer thing. They're just, it's an abs, he starts out with an abstract argument. He is not going, like, it's so crazy to me that I always notice that they, they just don't engage with the, with the evidence. And he's about to talk about a theory that has to do with, you know, throwing out claims without doing anything, but he's not engaging with the evidence. Backed Maybe he by does. Some main points. The Gish Galloper just lets a constant stream of worthless information spew out of their mouth in a confident manner. Once enough time has passed, the person debating the Gish Galloper has no chance. To uh, 
to debunk all of the poor information presented and explain their side. And the Gish Gallopers audience leaves happy thinking that their side won. Gish galloping is a dirty but effective debate method in a live debate. It's really hard to go up against. But as Robert's about to find out, it doesn't work as well in video format because if somebody uh -uh. be like me wants to, we can pause it point by point and explain away his lies. I don't want this video to be an attack on Robert. I'm not gonna talk about his credentials or his lack of credentials. I'm going to let him do the talking. I want to use his own words and show his audience that he is by not saying the his credentials he portrays were his himself oh my God. And for those of you who already know that he's full of it, I want to show you how to kind of- I don't know who this guy is. His so. argument so that when others try to use it, you don't get stuck in the gish gallop. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a straw man. <laughs> the Merriam-Webster Dictionary describes a straw man. Dude, I would have thought that that was a that that was like a joke. Like this was like like this is a literal like that's a meme that somebody like Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines this. Like oh Man, it's and it's a second abstract argument, by the way. He brings in straw man, which is the most basic of the abstract arguments. And as a weak or imaginary argument set up only to be easily confuted. The straw man goes like this. Person B says, that's silly. I just can't accept the idea that humans evolved from bananas. You can believe that, but I don't. The idea that humans evolved from bananas is the straw man. That isn't something that evolution theory says happens. It's a fake argument that person B made up so that they can attack that argument instead of evolution theory, trying to make their opponent look silly. And while various hypotheses pertaining to humanity's origins are discussed at the university level, the out of Africa theory is heavily favored despite compounding evidence to the contrary, because it seems to support a social engineering political agenda rather than a scientific one. Out of Africa is part of a social engineering political conspiracy. That's a big claim. One that Robert has indicated he will be debunking in this short video. Under 15 minutes, I believe he said. In his next line, he's going to be offering one of those various hypotheses that he says competes with the out of Africa model for human origins. Well, the straw man stuff. Another is. theory which is touched upon is called the aquatic ape, which I covered in a prior video that postulates that mankind did not necessarily come about from monkeys and great apes, but may have shared a common ancestor that evolved around water, whether on the surface of the earth by lakes, rivers, and oceans, or in subterranean caverns, which also contain similar bodies of water, with some upright okay, walking did... hominins later taking to the trees to evolve into branch climbing monkeys or fur covered apes. Robert starts with an interesting take, trying to convince his audience that anthropologists discuss what the aquatic up, ape Frenchie? hypothesis doing, as if it competes with the out Glad of Africa model. It doesn't. And even if it were true, it wouldn't compete with the out of Africa model. The okay, look, I mean, I don't think that the aquatic ape theory is, is really like has much teeth to it. I don't know. I haven't looked into it at all, but it's just because like the out of africa theory has been the dogma for a while doesn't mean that it should be and like if he's not going to debate like aquatic ape whatever. hypothesis which was proposed by marine biologist alistair hardy in 1960 proposed that humans have some traits that may have evolved in a more aquatic environment the implication be this is the anunnaki that's what's happening in that sometime between our last common ancestor with chimps and the modern day, a population we descend from lived near water and spent a lot of time in or around that water. Sort of like some modern day populations that have adapted to their more aquatic lifestyle. This hypothesis is not taken all that seriously by- But that's- this hypothesis is not taken all that seriously by anthropologists. That does that's not evidence against it. A paleoanthropologist, it kind of sits up there with the stone ape hypothesis. It can be kind of fun to talk about around a campfire. No, there's there's real evidence of the stoned ape, ape hypothesis. It is supported by the archaeological record in in um excuse me, what's the field? The subfield is Ah, oh, crap. Uh, bio, bio archaeology. It's what's the subfield? I don't know Robert Seffer either, but uh, we're, we're, this is, 
more about like how these people make arguments. Um, it's it's the archaeology when they look at plant. I'm going to Google it. Archaeology of plant remains. I mean, th there's real archaeology evidence of that. Bio or, or archaeobotany. Of course, archaeobotany. Archaeobotany is what I'm talking about. It is a real subfield of uh, bioanthropology or of archaeology, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's archaeobotany. They look at the structure of plant and animal residue on bottles and things. They found very old uh, hallucinogenic remains in like fortified wine in like Greek things. They've they found evidence of this in, in older um even older, it's it's harder when it's thousands and thousands of years old and we're back to like the Stone Age. But like all of these theories at this time are just basic theories. The other theories, while they're more accepted by anthropologists, there's still not a lot of evidence for them. There isn't one winner in this theory. It's and it's like he's talking about out of Africa, but or I guess he moved on to aquatic ape theory, but like, it's not like there is one main theory for this. So yeah, you can attack aquatic ape, you can attack stoned ape, but it's possible that it was a little bit of all of them. And it's not like there's one accepted theory. Some of the other ones are um, fish oils, which actually would support the aquatic ape theory because if fish oils over 2 million years are increasing, um, which is, this is a much more accepted theory, the, uh, the fats, were increasing brain growth, then that makes sense that we would be eating a lot of fish if we were like coming up on the water. And again, I don't know if aqua aquatic ape theory is real, but he's saying that this one isn't a real theory, whereas like we really don't know because it's so long ago. So there's really not evidence for it. There's not enough evidence for it to say one way or the other. But the evidence doesn't necessarily support it. In fact, as we've learned more Paleo and more over the um, decades, we've realized a lot of those initial claims they could be explained away in ways other than living near water. But they now could let's be. listen it doesn't to what mean Sefer says the aquatic ape hypothesis postulates, and let's see if you can identify the straw man on your own. What's up? Dude, this guy. <laughs> let's see if you can identify the straw man like a good nine-year-old. Some upright walking hominins later taking to the trees to evolve into branch-climbing monkeys or fur-covered apes. If the aquatic ape hypothesis were true, it would not mean that we didn't evolve from apes. I mean, look at the name, aquatic ape. So following that logic, the ancestor that adapted to the water would have had to have existed after the split between chimpanzees and humans. That common ancestor goes back around 7 million years. The aquatic ape would exist less than 7 million years ago. So when Robert claims that the aquatic ape hypothesis actually says hominins evolved first near water, and okay. then some of them went I mean, up now to this the guy's trees doesn't and became sense, monkeys I don't really apes, care. he is showing that he either lacks a fundamental understanding of what evolution theory says, or he is setting well, I don't know. We didn't see the rest of what he says. for his audience. He's setting and that appears to man. be the case because he's okay. going to well, keep I want to building more. on this idea of monkeys and apes evolving from humans in this next segment. And while this may sound counterintuitive, mainly because of decades of media conditioning, the concept does share some parallels among some of the world's foremost geneticists and evolutionary biologists who may or may not also have received the coupon at Red Lobster. Remember, everything... Okay, so... Robert Seffer is also not really, I don't know who this guy is. I, I think that he's like, he's known as like a, a, he's like out there. And he, I think some people might consider him racist. I don't know. Uh, not that I would care if they did, but I want to know how he's perceived by people. The thing Robert just said about some experts believing hominins evolved around it's water. It's the same type of argument that the other guys to the used. trees where some evolved into monkeys and apes. He's now going to introduce one paleo anthropologist and he's picking this one trying to get his audience to believe that this smart, intelligent expert agrees with what Robert just said. Dr. Owen Lovejoy is a distinguished evolutionary anthropologist at Kent State University, Ohio, best known for his work on australopithecine, locomotion, and the origins of bipedalism. True. Lovejoy has published more than 100 articles related to his research, and is most well known for his work on reconstructing Lucy, an alleged human ancestor with an opposable big toe on its feet, meaning they resembled thumbs for grasping branches and climbing trees. 
Pretty much true, especially the information yeah. regarding Dr. Lovejoy. But he's being sneaky here yeah. to set up a future lie. When discussing Lucy's feet, he did not show the feet of an Australopithecine. Mm. Instead, he showed a picture of the feet of Artie the Artipithecus. Australopithecine feet are much more human-like than that picture. And you'll see why I mention this yeah, later. that makes sense. While Lovejoy claimed that Lucy, which was dated to 3.4 million years ago, was at least partially bipedal, he proposes that Artie, another alleged human ancestor dated to between 4 and 5 million years ago, spent more of its time allegedly walking than Lucy, despite being over a million years older. This is one reason I had to explain that. There's another one coming up. Robert is now bringing up another hominin, Artipithecus, the owner of those feet, in an attempt to cast doubt on our understanding of human evolution. It is true okay, that this isn't that interesting. Robert Seffer I think it's just got attention because it got Robert Seffer's that by name. saying this, he means human footprint fact that it appeared so much different than the okay, other you know evidence. What? Let's skip the rest of this one. You guys can check it out if you want. Please check if this video is marked for YouTube kids. Ah, you're killing me. Is there anything else you guys want me to, to put on before I get out of this? Um, oh, you know what? I know what I'm going to do. Let's do, um, let's see what, uh, what Hank Green at the beginning. What's his John Green? Uh, what's his history thing called? And there's one he does on Native Americans that's just really bad. Check out ancient bloodlines slash contemporary power. Robert covered this in one of his videos. All right, I will check that out later. Definitely. Um, capitalism. I'd love to hear what this guy has to say about capitalism. Oh, gosh. Why do we have different skill colors? Human evolution. Oh, God. History, Black American history, big history, U.S. history, world history. Hi, and welcome to Crash Course. Oh, I I pulled down the the JRE stream. It, it was you know it was a lot. It was it was long. It was way too damn long. Um, Oh, God. Let's hear what John Green Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to tell the story. The natives and the English. Let's do that. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to talk about one of the worst relationships in American history. No thought bubble. Not my college girlfriend and me. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, your relationship with your high school girlfriend? Oh, me from the past. You and I both know that I didn't have a high school girlfriend. No, I'm talking about the relationship between Native Americans and English settlers. <laughs> All right. It smells like communism, sure does. So as you'll no doubt remember from last week, the first English settlers came to the Chesapeake area, now Virginia, in 1607. The land the English found was, of course, already inhabited by Indian tribes unified under the leadership of Chief Wahoon Sonica. And I will remind True. you that mispronouncing things is my thing. The English uh, called what, this Chief Wyandotte? Powhatan because, of course, mispronouncing things no, the was Powhatan also their thing. Powhatan was actually his title and the name of his tribe. But to say that the English... Look, okay. People give names to other people that are not their own, okay? Like, a lot of the Native American names that exist in, like, the U.S. are names that other tribes had for them that were not their own, okay? I mean, this always happens. The name of Hungary in is not Hungary. It's Magyarsovak, something like that. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Mag Magyarsovak, whatever. It's not Hungary, okay? Why is that not the same thing? We don't call, like, freaking France, they call it whatever. Uh, you know what? So everybody does that. They did it too. Would be it, they didn't call the English. So Powhatan English. didn't get to be the leader of over 30 tribes by being a dummy. And he quickly realized that one, the English were pretty clueless when it came to not dying of starvation. And two, they were useful because they had guns. Yes, so he exactly. decided to help them. And the English the were indeed had. grateful. In fact, colony leader John Smith went so far as to order the colonists to stop stealing food from the Indians. Oh, in the book business, this is known as foreshadowing. So as previously noted, relationships, whether between individual... You think the Indians were stealing food from the colonists too at plenty of different times? They were. There's plenty of accounts of it. These are like, this is what they, they always just say what the, what the white people did bad. And like, I get it. White people did bad stuff. A lot of it. And like a lot of the stuff that, that early English settlers did to Native Americans is bad by any standard. But like, 
Come on. You have some cultural relativity here, right? Schools or collectives tend to go well when they are mutually beneficial. And for a while, both the English and the Indians were better off for these interactions. Okay. I mean, you know, post he admits that. That is true. I mean, th there were periods of good and there were periods of bad. And over time, the English and then the Europeans broadly just really won out. And there were many genocides. Um, is and that's that's what happened. That is, there's no sugarcoat in it. That's that is what happened. But you know, people will annihilate each other. That that is that is what they do. Many such cases. Smallpox. The Virginia Company existed to make money, and since the Chesapeake lacked gold or silver, making money required <laughs> trade. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thought bubble. We tend to think of trade between Europeans and natives as being a one-way exchange, like savvy, exploitative Europeans tricking primitive, pure indigenous people into unfair that's deals. That's true. This that is a myth. Quite accurate. Okay, he's Both doing a good job so far. This is not bad at all for those they did not. The English were happy to give up iron utensils, tools, guns, woven cloth in exchange for furs and especially in the early days, food, which the Indians could easily part with because they had plenty. Soon, though, there were. So like, yeah, I mean, no, no, no. Good. Good on him for doing that. He's right. It's like and I view it that way as well, is that it's like it's pretty racist to be like, oh, yeah, these people were dumb. They didn't know that's racist. OK, like they were the they thought they were getting one over on the English. And th this is a. This is a beneficial trade relationship, right? I mean, ultimately, the it doesn't go well in the end, but you know, it's beneficial trade relationships in the sense that the natives want things that the Europeans have that are highly valued, and they have a surplus of something else, and then the English have a surplus of certain things, and they want stuff that the Indians have that they really need that's higher, highly valued. So, I mean, it's a good thing. This is the best version of the free market. Problems in order to keep up trade relations, Indian men devoted more time to hunting and less to agriculture, which upset traditional gender balance in their society. And European ideas Ooh. about land use started to overcome traditional Indian ways of life. Okay, so this is you know culture. This is a cultural thing where like you know they they they're losing their culture and their identity already because they're adopting another way of life. Um, and that led to conflict. People will like defensive. <laughs> people will annihilate each other. Ill scholar. Yeah, you could quote me, bro. In some of their land, which kept the Indians off it, and also the English let their pigs and cattle roam freely. And the this is true. This is true. And there were there were a lot of issues between. And this also happened in New England. But there was like the Indians pastoralists. Um, they didn't have as many animals, but like the Indians were pastoralists. Um, or horticulturalists, rather. Um, I think in the Chesapeake they were as well, but they definitely were up in New England. And and they would do some hunting and gathering, but they would do a lot of uh, planting crops. They they had the three sisters in like this whole area, not just in the Southwest. Um, the, th the three sisters being traditional crops of corn, beans, and squash, uh, which rounds out a pretty good base of a diet. So the English let their pigs and cattle roam freely, and the animals would eat native crops. It's a problem. It's a problem animals would eat natives crops and as europeans appetite for furs grew indian tribes began to fight with each other over access to the best hunting grounds leading Incentives. to intertribal warfare yeah. which suddenly included but they were already killing each other and and it is true and this often gets brought up as like <laughs> people be annihilating i seen it i seen it thank you yes i seen it uh, Europeans' appetites for furs grew. Indian tribes began to fight with each other over access to the best hunting grounds. They were already fighting each other. The inclusion of guns is a technology change that changed their traditional style of warfare, which was, it really was, it is true, it was more ceremonial. But that just means they were killing each other less. But with the, and they did that because their their weapons weren't as deadly. So that could happen. You You would survive in a lot of cases. The guns were much more deadly, and the inclusion meant different things that a lot of people would die. And uh, but they had the culture of having that that this commonality of warfare, and that doesn't just go away just because now more people are dying because there's still other social implications of having um, these these ceremonial wars because they have to decide who's in charge. But now they have better weapons. And everyone's dying and they can't they and then the culture would have to shift but in that meantime as it shifts with like this shock there's issues and the the native america they never get out of this i mean they never get out of like the constant change and and they never get back to a to a baseline you know it's it's sad
the guns. But this was still a relatively calm time. Yes, at one point, John Smith was captured by the Indians and had to be saved yes. by Sohattan's daughter. And, and Frenchie, this, uh, the thing with the Atlantic slave trade into West Africa is that when people got slaves, when African kingdoms got slaves and then traded those slaves for more guns, it was like, you know, fulfilling. It was like a snowball effect, right? Because then one people, the ones that are taking the slaves, are now even more capable of taking more slaves to get more guns. And there was this blobbing effect of mm -hmm. kingdoms taking each other over. And uh, yeah, th this, this happens in a lot of places when there's an introduction of a new technology. Pocahontas, but this was probably all a ritual planned by Powhatan to demonstrate his dominance over the English. Pocahontas never married John Smith, by the way, but she was kidnapped by the English and held for ransom in 1613, and she did eventually marry another Englishman, John Rolfe. She converted to Christianity and went to England, where she became a sensation and died of disease. Stupid of course, disease, always reciting the course of human history. Anyway, despite not marrying Pocahontas, John Smith is still important to this story because when he left Virginia for England after being injured in a gunpowder explosion, things between the Native Americans and the English immediately began to deteriorate. Yeah, How? Okay, well, the so English this, went back to stealing... This is another thing, right? So sometimes great man theory has been under attack, um, but great man theory has its place, and it especially has its place where there's a lot fewer people because then one person can have a big effect. And we're not talking about large populations here. So the English went back to stealing the crops. Their leader left. Their leader knew that to keep peace with the Native Americans, that he had to do certain things and he was successful, but there was nobody who was willing to keep that going. And let's see what happens. Indians crops and also began stealing their lives via massacres. Oh, thanks, Doc okay. Man, you guys I mean, sure know how to end on a that, downer. Although, to be happened. fair, there are not a lot of uppers in this story. So after a period of peace following Pocahontas' marriage to John Rolfe in 1614, dramatized here. Marriages between royal families, in this case, not necessarily royal, but but uh, squaw or sachem, uh, a, a lower level tribal leader is, I mean, this is how you secure alliances. It is. And it likely would have been against some other native enemies of the native americans here things oh, finally sorry. came to a head in 1622 when chief opachankanuf led a rebellion against the english it had become abundantly clear that more and more english were going to show up and they weren't just there to trade they wanted to take indian land but the english struck back as empires and will and the uprising an enemy, of 1622 ultimately like failed. and after another failed enemy, uprising in 1644 the 2000 remaining unites. native americans were forced to sign a treaty that really consigned does. them to reservations in the west well the west of virginia at least <laughs> but the 1622 uprising was the final nail in the coffin of the virginia Virginia company, which was a failure in every way. It never turned a profit, and despite sponsoring 6,000 colonists, by 1644, when Virginia became a royal colony, only 1,200 of those people were still alive, proving once again that governments are better at governing than corporations. Up in New England, you'll recall that the Pilgrims probably wouldn't have survived their first winter without help. The from the Native Americans, which of course led to the first Thanksgiving and then centuries of mutually beneficial trade and generosity, just kidding. While some of the Puritans who settled in New England, notably Roger Williams, tried to treat the Indians fairly, in general, it was very similar to what we saw in the Chesapeake. Settlers thought Native Americans could be replaced because they weren't properly using the land. Now, John Winthrop, who you'll remember from last week, at least realized that it was better to buy land from Indians than just take it. But Puritan land purchases usually came with strings attached, the main string being that the Native Americans had to submit to English authority. Now, the Puritans had a rather conflicted view of the Indians. On the one hand, they saw natives as heathens in need of salvation, as evidenced by the Massachusetts seal, which features an Indian yes. saying, come over and help us. On the other hand, they recognized <laughs> that the Native American way of life, with its relative abundance and equality, especially when it came to women, might be tempting to some people who might want to go native. This was such a concern well, that in 16... So, oh, oh, one second. Let me replace the battery. So this is often... This is often talked about, and, and this is actually one that I'm not going to throw away in the sense that there's actually some, some teeth on the idea that, excuse me, there is actually some teeth on the idea that um, they were concerned about English people and other settlers fleeing to join the Native Americans. And, and that is because it happened a lot. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's true that it was more, you know, egalitarian is the word they use. I would say like, you know, the English society is stratified. Uh, it was a class-based society. It, it was more, maybe not egalitarian because it, it wasn't, it was egalitarian in a lot of material ways, but it was like, 
you there wasn't there was extreme social mobility in the sense that it was based on merit. It was a true meritocracy and merit in like a very simple sense of like, you know, winning a fight or, you know, being a good orator. It's like there is chances for advancement. So you do see a lot, a lot, a lot like there's there's a lot of, re, or of evidence of this. There's because it's written about in newspapers in like the 1700s, not just the 1600s of people just running away. And it's running away, joining native, going native. It was a thing that happened. Um, so yeah, I thought I was going to be disagreeing, but I actually think he's done an, an okay job so far. In 42, the Massachusetts General Court prescribed a sentence of three years hard labor for anyone who left the colony and went to live with the indigenous people. There was Look, even anti india propaganda problem, in the form right? of books, captivity narratives in which Europeans recounted their desire to return to Christian society after living with the Indians were quite popular, even though some, like The Famous Sovereignty and Goodness of God by Mary Rowlandson, did admit that the Indians often treated their European captives quite well. Okay, New so England's native population... Okay, no, 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 no. Nope. No, 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 no. That is wrong. Um, so basically there were there were two options in the Northeast, and this was true in a lot of other areas, but across the East Coast, they had this thing called mourning wars. And people, um, you know, kids of a certain age would be killed. Kids of another certain age, a little bit older, would be more likely to be adopted. And um, it, it depends on the culture on what happened. But, you know, you would fill the spot of somebody who had died. You like they would adopt you. But if they didn't do that, they would kill you and they wouldn't just kill you. They would torture you to death. And some of them had things like running the gauntlet. So if if a captive was taken in most cases, and this becomes a different thing in like the plains and the, there's there's different times of this. But in most cases that I'm aware of. If you are taking captive, like if you're a captive for more than a few days, because that's like how long it would generally take, then you are going to be treated well because they've decided to keep you. But all of the cases where there's no captive, they killed you. And that was in a lot of the cases. Um, and they tortured you to death. And this isn't, look, like this is, that's not to say that like they're worse than Europeans. Like that's just, it really is functional. Like you can't just like, they don't have jails. They can't capture you and then worry about you escaping. They can't let you go so you can kill their people again. So it's like, you know, kill you. It's, it's not the English were doing the same thing is what I'm saying. This is uh this is mutual. And I'm not like, you know, this guy's on the side of like, Oh, noble savage a little bit, but lacked an overarching leader like Powhatan. But by 1637, the inevitable conflict between the English and the Indians did happen. It was called the Pequot War. After some Pequots killed an English fur trader, soldiers from Massachusetts, the newly formed colony of Connecticut, and some Narragansett Indians who saw an opportunity to gain an upper hand over the Pequots attacked a Pequot village at Mystic, burning it and massacring over 500 people. The war continued for a few happened months after this, but to call county. it a war is in yeah, a way to give it too happened. much credit. The Indians were overmatched from the beginning. It, look, it was a war and it wasn't the Indians. The the English settlers had a lot of native tribes the and that that participated in the slaughter as well, by the way. But they attacked a village, a, a fort palisade village, and they killed uh, pretty much everybody. Beginning, and by the end, almost all of them had been massacred or sold into slavery. That's not really true. <coughs> Excuse me. The people from this group have two federally recognized, recognized tribes in Connecticut today, and there's a third group in Ohio. Okay, they're not. Th these. <laughs> this is the thing that gets into it. The people that got massacred here were like the overlords of Connecticut, the uh, the Pequot, and they were the overlords, and they subjugated all the rest of the people. So all the rest of the people were willing to fight against them. It's not as bad as the Aztec situation because they weren't as bad rulers, but like the Narragansett who lived in Rhode Island and all the other people in Connecticut, all the other natives were like, oh, yeah, we'll fight them. And then that happened. So there were a lot of native allies, mostly the Narragansett and then some other peoples or they just chose not to participate. And then Connecticut is formed. My home state is formed from basically the land territory of the Pequot. But they owned like all of Connecticut, even though they were just in like a few towns in like what is today a few towns so like that's what happened it's it's not like they were completely innocent but they they did get massacred including 
women and children in it and it wasn't cool but they didn't nearly all die a lot of them were sold into slavery yes but they were able to return and then 40 years later they were the they were the main ally of the new england confederation when they fought against um uh, a rebellion of native americans that was a huge genocidal king philip's war which is the deadliest war in american history by percentage of deaths in the Caribbean. The war opened up the Connecticut River to further settlement. It also showed yes, that Native okay. Americans were going to have a tough time resisting because they were outnumbered and they had inferior weapons. But the brutality of them- Essentially, this could not have happened without Native allies. The, the tracking in the forests, they needed the Native allies, not for the numbers, but for their skills. Um, King Philip's War, the, the Pequots, the people that were massacred here, nearly all dead. No, 30, 40 years later, in the lifetimes of some of them, they were on New England's side. And that's why Connecticut took none of the fighting of this. It was all Vermont, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. There were a bunch of battles there. There was like a couple in Connecticut because the Pequot were in Connecticut and they protected it. Massacre and Mystic shocked even some Puritans like William. Yeah, Bradford, I mean, it was a bad massacre. It was a fearful it was. sight to see them yeah. frying and burn down the whole But thing. despite oh. the odds, New England natives continued to resist the English. In 1675, Native Americans launched their biggest attack on New England about, colonists in what would come to be known as yeah. King Philip's War. And he's not mentioning that the Pequot are on the side of the English in this. It was led by a Wampanoag chief named Medicom, which is why it is also sometimes called Medicom's War. The English called Medicom King Philip due to their fantastic cultural sense. No, this isn't true. Oh my God. He called himself King Philip, dude. Okay, so the idea that you only have one name and you have one name for life is actually a Western idea. So it's culturally insensitive for you to say that. So it's culturally in insensitive for you to say that this guy wasn't called King Philip because he did call himself King Philip. That this is incorrect and it is culturally insensitive. You patronizing. Sensitivity. The conflict was marked by brutality loser. on both sides, and it nearly ended uh, English settlements in the Northeast. The fighting itself lasted two years. Indians attacked half of the 90 towns the English had founded, and yep. 12 of those towns were destroyed. About yep. 1,000 of the 52,000 Europeans and 3,000 of the 20,000 Indians involved yep. died in the war. As I mentioned All before, accurate. the war was particularly brutal. The Battle of the Great Swamp was really just a massacre of Indians by the English, and when yep. King Philip was finally killed, ending the war, his decapitated head was placed now, to be fair, the Battle of the Great Swamp, yes, it was a massacre, but they were hiding in the swamp and they were, you know, he just, he literally just said there were 10 villages destroyed. Look, I get it. This was an annihilation war, though. N neither of them, if the Native Americans had won, they would have killed all the English. And you can say like, well, it's their land. I get it. But like it, it look, they were you, you or me. That's what it comes down to, man stake in the Plymouth Town Square, where it remained for decades. And on the other yeah. side, well, to quote barbaric, Nathaniel Saltonstall, who lived time. through the war, the heathen rarely gave quarter to those that they take, but if they were women, they first forced them to satisfy their filthy lusts and then murdered them. Saltonstall went on to describe a particularly brutal Yeah, I mean, that probably happened. ...way that natives would kill colonists' cows by cutting their bellies and letting them go several days, trailing their guts after them. That indigenous people would reserve such brutality for livestock says something really important important about this war. The Indians correctly saw European colonization as a threat to their way of life. And that included the animals who trampled Indians' land and whose grazing patterns required the English to take more and more territory. Some of the stories told about Native American brutality also suggest the symbolic nature of this war, like one English colonist was disemboweled and had a Bible stuck in his body cavity. Supposedly, the natives who buried him explained, you English, since you came into this country, have grown exceedingly above the ground. Let us see how well you Oof. grow when planted into the ground. But it wasn't just the Indians Indians who felt their way of life being threatened. It's time for this week's mystery document. The rules here are simple. I read the mystery document, I try to guess its author. If I'm right, I don't get shocked with the shock pen. If I'm wrong, I do. The righteous God hath heightened our calamity and given commission to the barbarous heathen to rise up against us and to become a smart rod and a severe scourge to us in burning and depopulating several hopeful plantations, murdering many of our people of all sorts and seeming as it were to cast us off. 
This reminds me of Israel Palestine, man. I mean, it's they're both settler colonialism. They've done kind of the same thing. Hereby speaking aloud to us to search and try out our ways and turn again unto the Lord our God, from whom we have departed with a great backsliding. Okay, I don't know this one, so I'm gonna have to piece it together. Uh, we have a plural narrator. That's important. Seemingly monotheistic, feels like the heathens in this context, likely the Native Americans, have been sent as a scourge or scourge, as it is apparently properly pronounced. What, I'm from Alabama. I don't know how to say a ton of words. I mean, I just recently learned that you don't check your Yahoo mail, you check your Yahoo mail. And Yahoo's over already. Right, so plural <laughs> narrator, scourge, great backsliding. Oh, uh, Stan, you're gonna get the shot here this time. Who is it? The laws of war passed by the General Court of Massachusetts in 1675. Are you kidding? From now on, the mystery document must always be written by a yeah. single human person. I hate this. I hate this so much. It's worse now because I've had it before, so now it's gonna. Ah! This shows us the way the Puritans understand the world, but it also shows us that within 50 years of its founding, Puritans already felt that the mission of their colony to be a great Christian community was already kind of a failure. If they'd been as righteous as they were supposed to be, God wouldn't have sent the Indians to burn their homes and kill them. So it's important it's to understand that, that this wow. was a war to preserve a way of life for both the Indians and the English. And that All brings right, us man. to another question. What's yeah, the point of even right. telling these bloody stories about massacres and atrocities? One point is to remind ourselves that much of what we learn about American history, like all history, has been cleaned up to conform to our mythological view of ourselves. Native yeah, Americans have been so Rothschild. successfully marginalized, both geographically and metaphorically, that it's easy to either forget I mean, about true. them or else to view them merely as people to be pitied or reviled. But it's important to know the ways right. that they resist the colonization them. because it reminds us that Native Americans were people who acted in history, not just people who were acted upon by it. And it also okay. reminds us that the history I'm of indigenous you, people on this landmass isn't separate. Oh, this is from America. 10 years ago. The updated one is way more woke. Guys, this is from 10 years ago. This is from 2013. That's when this shit started. That's why you're hearing a rational take. American history, it's an essential part of it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you mm. next week. Crash Course right. is produced and directed. Well, that's it for me. Any other questions, check on the Discord. Um, if you want to listen to more right now, check out the podcast. Links will be... Uh, Link should be coming up right now, actually. that's That should be how it works.